On the last video, we spoke about all sorts of fascinating aspects of psychology, and I will be putting the link up, so don't miss out on that video. It was, it was really good. Um, lo lo lots of we related a lot of psychological principles to what's going on, to the way that people are reacting, mm. and uh, it made it made a lot of sense. Now, the other thing you've done, Ros, is you've taken I don't know that was there about five or six thousand comments, I think, on the other video, and a lot of questions. Um, now. Um, I know, I know you're doing a lot of work on the, for the Australian Royal Commission at the moment, so we ha you haven't got time to answer them all, obviously. No. But um, you've come up with themes. I in the spirit of good qualitative analysis, you've come up with themes. Mm -hmm. And uh, maybe we could just, get, just spend a few minutes on each of these. One theme that kept coming up in the feedback that you identified was anger. Mm. Absolutely. How were people expressing anger and why? how are people expressing anger um, in so many different ways. I Really, my point there was there were a lot of comments and I think we received over 10,000, whether it was emails, comments on your video. We, we're trying to get through them all, but there's a lot of people that are still really, really angry. And I wanted to acknowledge that um, because the anger is very real. I, as you said, I've just been um, spent the last week or two having to do my own personal feedback to this Royal Commission. And during that process, I had to wade back through the last few years and there hundreds and hundreds of emails and uh, um, various pieces that I was sent from ARPRA and all these different gov government departments threatening me with this, that and the other. And going back through them, even though I've sort of mostly moved beyond the anger, anger I was right back there, John. and. The anger is very, very real, and please don't think for a second that I am dismissing it from any people that are listening to this. We've been put through hell. Um, most of us, myself included, we were, we've lost huge amounts of friends, our family, many members of family. It's been brutal. Um, what I would say to that is that working our way through emotions is really really important one of the fastest ways we can actually get through emotions and it's quite different from that british keep calm and carry on is actually by owning them and acknowledging them i'm not for a second saying that your anger isn't uh real expected um etc but i do believe that anger is not the solution when people get angry they're not able to uh think and use the parts of their brain that are the most useful for finding solutions. So we're going to be talking about that. Um, I'm doing a psychological series with a, another psych and we'll be getting different psych guests in. Um, but do it, like I said, doing the work on those is really important. Um, but while you're in that state of anger, um, it's very, very difficult to be productive. A lot of people also were talking about why aren't we on Telegram um, and various other channels. The thing I find with Telegram, and I spent huge amounts of time on Telegram at the start of my um, awakening, whatever you want to call it. Um, Telegram is brilliant. Alignment with the nature of reality. Yeah, just find, just hearing all these different um, takes on what's going on. The problem I find with Telegram is that on the whole, people tend, tend to be really focused on the more fight flight type issues. They're looking at all the the horrors that have gone on um, and again a lot of people have said I'm naive I'm not naive I've been here they took my license almost three years three years ago I've been certainly exposed to some incredibly dark pieces with this but for me if I get fixated on that it keeps me in that fight flight position it's not the place of solutions so for people who are really struggling with their anger um, if they can, join up with local groups who are also aware. Um, even things like journaling. I mean, that, you know, writing down what's uh, troubling you the most and working through those emotions. Interestingly, um, a lot of the people, well, actually, I had a couple of emails from people who have been, we call them anti-vaxxers, for decades. So the people that have been calling this out for such a long time. And what's interesting with, with those couple of emails is those people both said, um, well, you know, if anyone should be angry, we should. We've known about this for ages. 
Um, but in both cases, these people are sort of have come to a place of peace because they've been in that state of anger for so long. They've been mocked and shamed and all those uh, pieces that really do escalate the anger. Yet they've now metabolized that, as it were, and they're ready to start looking at solutions. So for people that are still looking for um, justice and taking down of governments and shaming and blaming all sorts of pieces, I just try and have a think about those people who have been long-term anti-vaxxers, as it were. Um, if anyone could turn around and say, we're never going to forgive, it's them. But they tend to have moved on. And just a final piece there, John, I don't know what the situation with vaccinations, you know, as a greater sort of piece is. I was someone that always was vaccinated. I, I never questioned it, like most people listening. Uh, we, we just sort of did what we were told. Do I now think that all vaccinations are, are bad? Um, I don't know. I don't know. But what I do know is that I will never take another one or put another one, um, you know, as a mother um, until this has been publicly debated. Because again, if there's nothing to, if we're all completely wrong um, and, and just have our, I don't know, have been sort of caught up in, in narratives that have uh, taken us to a place that is naive, then let's just debate it. Get these people in a ring, get the pharma companies, get the vaccine scientists around because there's huge numbers of them that are calling this out and let them publicly debate it. I mean, why wouldn't you let that be publicly debated if there was nothing to hide? If we're all nuts, it's a really easy piece, I think, to uh, to deal with. Do you think? Well, I'll certainly, I'll certainly take some persuading to get another mRNA or adenovirus vector vaccine. That is for sure. Mm -hmm. And, and part of the reason we're carrying on with this is there's huge plants in Australia. I think there's one in, I'm not sure if it's Brisbane or Melbourne. I think it might be, I'm not sure it's one or the other, I think, where they're going to build 100 million of these vaccines a year. There's one in near Oxford, Harwell Science Park in the UK, where they're planning on making 250 million doses of mRNA vaccines a year. For, for what? Anyway, that, that's, I haven't pulled it. Is that the... Well, well for, 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 the, um, for COVID, for... Um, for RSV, I think, and influenza are the ones they're working on. I don't know what state they are, but there seems to be a huge move into this new technology, and um, it really is quite frightening. Mm. There's big deals with the government and all sorts. Well, good luck to them. I mean, given the percentages of people now taking boosters is very, very low, I'm not sure how they're going to... Uh... Yeah, but if they, if they try and replace all the traditional vaccines with mRNA vaccines, that could be a... Mm. That could be a bit of a problem. Anyway, let's stick with your themes, Ros. Uh, otherwise, we yes, <laughs> I do get distracted. To stay short. Anger was the first one. Forgiveness is your second theme. Yeah, um, and forgiveness is really can be really really tricky because a lot of us have been, and myself included, um, cut out of family Christmases at the start. Really, really um, mocked, shamed, etc. And I think what's important to say here as well is that for those people who have lost loved ones, and there's many um, from vaccine injuries, uh, from the various pieces that have been that have uh, been put in front of us the last few years, forgiveness can be incredibly difficult. Uh, and I'm not saying for a second that we should just forget about everything that's done. But what I would say as a psychologist or as a former psychologist is that when we harbour long-standing anger, uh, when we sort of get caught in the anger loop and demanding forgiveness, there's a, a saying, I can't remember who said it, but that, you know, anger towards others is like drinking poison and expecting the other person to suffer. Do you know that one? And it's really yes. true. And I've got to admit, I've been there. I was there during these times where I've just been so furious at how I've been treated and so angry uh, and unable to forgive in the early times that it really can take over um, everything in your life. And at the end of the day, it's not productive. As, as you know, correct as it might be, it's not going to get you anywhere and it's not going to turn the other person around the people that are giving you all of this um you know 
Is what you're saying, Ros, that the, the main reason for forgiveness is is self healing, self help? Absolutely. The main reason for forgiveness is self preservation. Because when you hold anger towards others, it's not going to do anything to turn them around. In fact, and I'm sure you know, you're a father, aren't you, John? Yes, of course you are. Yep. When we, it's almost like demanding an apology out of a teenager. Do you remember when you were a kid and your mum was sort of saying, you must apologise. I'm not going to let you out of whatever punishment until you apologise. But, and you know, you might turn around as a child and say, OK, I'm, I'm sorry. But it's not heartfelt. It's not heartfelt. And so if you want forgiveness, I really do believe that you need to forgive and not openly, but forgive in your heart them first. It's trying to understand and having compassion for how they have taken the stance that they have. And that's why I do believe the psycho psychological piece is so important. Because if you can see them as people who are incredibly stuck, incredibly frightened, and their anger, that's where their anger is coming from. It's not a personal attack per se. It's coming from their own fears and their own, and these are unconscious, their own lack of uh, awareness and ability to find their way out of this, this situation. When you can give that forgiveness, that takes away the anger that's coming towards them. And when that anger has been ameliorated, then they feel safer to actually be able to begin to engage with the situation and look at these alternative narratives and potentially find their own way out. Your third, your third theme is dark agendas that came from the feedback in the emails. Yes, we were talking about this before, John. So there has been a lot of uh, feedback about being naive, about um, not understanding, you know, the darker agendas that are going on. Um, like I said before, in the last three years, I've pretty much been exposed to everything. Uh, there's always more, of course, but... What I would like to say to that one is to consider the platform we're on. We're on YouTube. If we start talking about the darkest agendas that are out there, John's not going to have his channel for too much longer. And not only that, there's the phrase, I'm sure you've heard it, that the frogs have been boiled slowly and they need to be cooled slowly. And if we start calling out the extent of those dark agendas, a lot of people just switch off. So they go from that sort of fight flight level down to a freeze level, the sort of dorsal vagal freeze. Because if someone is in a situation where the attacker, as it were, were is not able to be fought or run from, and these are the sort of polyvagal things we, we mentioned when we were chatting before, if you can't fight or, or run, flight, your way out of a situation, people go into a freeze state. And when people go into a freeze state, so that's the mouse in front of the lion, right? That's just completely frozen. They cannot take any information in at all. Their brains shut down pretty much. So going towards those pieces, yes, there's, there's some incredibly important pieces there, but I would suggest strongly that they're not uh, for YouTube. If you want to go and look at those, that's where you get onto Telegram and Signal, etc. And the dark agendas that I'm now aware of, um, increasingly aware of, mm. um, there's, a lot of them are pretty uncomfortable. I'd rather yeah. emotionally, in a sense, be back where I was four or five years ago and not know about these things. But yeah. I am actually pleased that I'm now more in contact with reality. It's just that reality is not a very nice place very often. It's not. And John, do you know, the way I have been talking about this for at least a couple of years now is I see this as almost, do you remember the story of Medusa? Yeah. And when you're battling Medusa with her Gorgon snakes and, you know, an incredibly terrifying and dangerous opponent, the way you defeat her is you hold a mirror up. Yeah. Remember that story? And that's sort of how I do it. I have been down many rabbit holes, whatever you want to call them, and looked into some incredibly dark pieces and they tend to immobilize me again going back to that polyvagal piece you freeze so what i do is i stay away from all of the extremely fearful pieces um i know they're there 
but my my work in trying to help people out of this can only be achieved if I don't look too deeply in them. It's not that I'm naive or unaware of them, but if I get too fixated on them, and I would strongly suggest that to, to many of the listeners, if, if, you, if you spend so much time getting caught up in them, you, you disarm yourself. The trouble is some of them are real threats, aren't they? Yes. Some of them are real dangers. Yes. Yes, they are. They are. But at the same time, as individuals, we have to pick our battles and we can't... We do have to pick our battles, but we also have to be strong in ourselves. And if looking too closely at them disempowers you, then it's it's sort of an opportunity cost point of view. It's what are you trying to do here? Are you trying to find a way out? Or are you, you know, trying to stare so far into the belly of the beast that you can't find your way out? Some people can. Um... But another point with that is people tend to get very caught up in, there's so many different theories, John, I'm sure you've been exposed to them. There's so many different uh, ways of looking at this. It's, it's, it's more the ones where there's factual evidence for that concern me and there's plenty of those, I think. Are you talking about the clots? Uh, all sorts of things, all sorts of vested interests that are acting against individual um, freedoms Mm -hmm. well the the sort of things you're talking about in your declaration there's many many threats in the modern world and many of those appear to be organized and coordinated and paid for absolutely in lockstep in lockstep let's move on to the fourth theme that you've identified was religion and spirituality what was the data that emerged there what, two pieces here. There's some very, very strong, uh, and again, I've been had people writing to me about this for, for the last three years since I made that first video. Very, very strong um, spiritual angles at looking at this and very strong religious ones. Um, and again, it's not that I'm unaware of them and it's not that some of them um, intuitively hold, I believe, great merit. Um, But it's just, if we look at this strategy of this, there's a lot of people that as soon as they hear these sorts of pieces, they will just lock down. They will use that as a a psychological defense to discredit what we're saying. So I'd say that towards the spiritual pieces. Um, One thing I wanted to mention with the religious pieces is to say publicly that I'm not religious myself. And the reason I raise that, and many of our lighthouse keepers have very, very strong faiths. Not all of them, some of them do. I don't myself. Uh, it's not that I have any problem with it. I personally went to an incredibly um, religious school, and it was through that, actually, that as a fairly young child, I, um, I felt that the lack of forgiveness, the lack of compassion, the speed with which people were damned as it were to eternity um it just it didn't it just didn't sit well with me because even though i don't follow that religion anymore i believe absolutely in the power of goodness and in the power of love within humans and i i would just urge those who do have very very strong religious convictions to maybe be a bit more tolerant to those of us who don't hold that position you don't have to have uh, extreme religious convictions to want the best for humanity and to believe the best of humanity yeah, good I'm not going to comment on that one because obviously a, a, a debatable one but that that's fine uh fifth point um Sitting, complaining, and not doing anything. This was, and this is the last point, this, so stick with this one. Yeah, this was one that I actually, it was one of the final pieces that got me to make my initial video. And it was right at the start when I was on Telegram all the time, when I was learning and finding out about these things three, four years ago. And one of the doctors, uh, I think her name's Dr. Christiane, I can't remember, Northrop, Northup, something something like that. I was reading her threads and a lot of people learning a lot about all of these uh, vaccines and and, uh, the the censorship, etc., etc. 
And she made the point that, and, she, and, and uh, it was her word, she said basically, stop sitting and bitching about this on Telegram and go and do something, yeah? Get out and make a video or etc. And I felt, I kind of went, oh, okay, then I will. Um, but that's just what I wanted to, to mention because there are a lot of people in the various comments uh, and emails we've received who put a huge amount of energy into tearing down what we're doing. Yet, I would just like to raise that question with them. What is it you're doing? And I'm not professing for a moment that we've got all the answers here. I'm looking at this as a psychologist because that's my skill, that's my craft. It's one of many ways. There's, I'm sure, a huge amount of other ways to deal with this problem. Um, certainly, I'd say to the guys out there as well, I, I think uh, the engineers, some of the smartest people I've met in the last few years and the way they look at this problem come from engineering. And that's a traditionally sort of masculine skill. So what, do we, what can we do looking at things from, from that angle and various other angles? But getting involved in comments and writing huge amounts of, of why we shouldn't be doing it this way, it's an opportunity cost piece again. What can you be doing? What can you be doing? I think that's one of the good things that's, that's come out of this, that, that, that different people with different cognitive analytical skills yes. have applied their way of problem solving, their way of looking at things, mm -hmm. and uh, are often coming up with very similar solutions. I mean, I, I've talked to people with backgrounds in engineering, mm. for example, yeah. who've assimilated one heck of a lot of medicine. Yeah. And uh, they, they really, as, as I understand things, they, you know, as I understand physiology, they've actually got it worked out really quite well. And it's, um, they do. It, it's really been quite a synergy in, in a lot of situations. Mm. Yes, the engineers have an enormous uh, insights and skills. And I think the, the big piece there is they have the complex systems viewpoint. I think it would also be really interesting to hear from some anthropologists here because really it's looking at us as a species sort of taking yourself out and looking down from an objective lens and look uh, at, at what it is all these different parts of our community are doing, why they hold the beliefs they do, what's led them there. It's fascinating. In fact, we could go through all the different uh, sort of epistemological yes. approaches to knowledge, really. I mean, historians, for example, just one that, you know, there's so much to learn from history. Huge, um, huge amounts to learn from history. Look, I'm a huge history buff and it was my, I, I, I sort of, that's what I focused on in my HSE, so my A-levels over here. But I, all the way through, I remember looking at history and having these sort of light bulb moments. If only we could make history compulsory because you sort of go and look back at all these ridiculous things we've done throughout history and uh and see that we're we're uh we're not actually as smart as we think we are and if we took the time to look and learn but we don't we don't tend to learn from our mistakes do we john learn from the mistakes of uh history or be destined to repeat them mm. no we we don't i mean I, I struggle to learn from my own mistakes never mind other people so it's uh, it is a human problem, but it's one we should be aspire to. If we can learn from the mistakes of others, yes, not make those mistakes yeah. again, then that would be a good thing. Yes. Well, they're the themes that you came up with, Roz. Excellent piece of qualitative research. Thank you for that. And uh, well, uh, anything else that emerges, let let, let us know. It's um, just one other piece I'd like to say. Synthesized a few things there. Just one other. Piece. Yeah. What? Well, yeah. And maybe this is one for people who are struggling with the anger and the forgiveness piece is just to remind yourselves that you're right, you're correct, you are on the right side of history. And I, I often talk, and people, other people have talked about it as well, is, is imagining how your grandchildren, your great-grandchildren, or if you're not a parent, your ancestors down the line will look back at what you've done and hold pride in what you've done. And it really is a, a piece that is very close to my heart. All we can do is the best that we can do. But with that, I believe that the anger, the vitriol, the demanding apologies and demanding, um, yeah, the demanding apologies isn't the, the, the way out of this. 
the way out of this mm -hmm. is understanding and forgiveness, I believe. Yep. And on that note, Ros, thank you very much. Always good to talk. And uh, any any further insights, you're always welcome back to, to talk about those. But, but for now, uh, th thank you very much. Thanks, John.